and that's okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Bella, yeah. put your put your uh, computer face it down a little bit because we only see half your face. There you go. Oh, oh, now you're now getting the real that. experience. Now we get the beautiful puna. <laughs> maybe she didn't. Maybe she didn't have her lipstick on. She didn't want you to see her lips. <laughs> She's off for puts. <laughs> I'm off for puts. You're gonna have to tell everyone. We're gonna have to do a Yiddish club just to learn your your terminology. You're so dark, and everybody. You else don't know for puts. No, not for me. I said for oh, others. Oh. I'm very cognizant of everyone else's Yiddish knowledge. Ah. <laughs> We're going to start in about one minute. So. It is wrong on the uh, thing there. <laughs> oh, blame Zoom. Yeah, I have to. Bella, did you have the soup? No, not yet. We had, because um, I had chicken last night. And ah. then this morning we went over to Weinstein's. So I had a whole bunch of freebies. How come? Because I had 185 points. And they gave oh. me a free sandwich, and I had I bought bagels for seven dollars. Okay. You're, you're making everyone hungry. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> and we're leaving pretty soon to go somewhere else. All right, I'm going to interrupt because I do want to make sure we are cognizant and value the time of uh, Detective McDermott today. So what I'm gonna do, just the the quick update for everyone. I am muting microphones, but I am not controlling your mic. So if there is a question in the middle of the presentation. Um, you can definitely unmute. I prefer that questions come at the end so that um, we can go through the slides. But if it's a pressing question, definitely unmute your mic or use the um, chat. And that way you won't forget your question. And we'll make sure that they are all addressed because uh, Detective McDermott has said that she will have time for questions and answers as well. So even if something wasn't covered in the presentation, you'll be able to ask those questions as well. She has a lot of knowledge in this. So first I'm just gonna unmute, I'm gonna mute what, everyone and then- why, why am I getting it all written in subtitles? You can turn what off subtitles. If you don't like subtitles, you can turn them off on your own. I'll teach you how to do it on a computer. Um, it is on your computer. If you go to your menu bar on the bottom and you see live transcript, you can hide it. So you can click that arrow and just do hide subtitles. If you are on a laptop, you'll wanna tap your screen once to bring up that menu and you can hide the subtitles. I'm using subtitles because I know it helps others. So if it's something that bothers you, you can definitely hide it on your own screen. Um, so Charlie, if you don't like that, you can also. I don't mind at all. Okay. Um, but I know that people- How do, about an iPad? I don't see it on You should have it, click on your screen once, you'll see more and you'll be able to hide subtitles. Not there. All right. No. Well, okay. Put a, put a piece of tape on the bottom of your screen. <laughs> the old fashioned way. All right, so I am going to, uh, first of all, welcome everyone back from New Year's. I know that we uh, were not here on Friday and I hope everyone had a very calm, quiet New Year's and everyone is healthy. And I wanted to just welcome today our presenter, which is Detective Charlie McDermott from the Phoenix Police Department. And one of the things that many police departments do not have that Phoenix puts a, prior a priority on is an actual unit that is dedicated to investigating bias and hate crimes. And Phoenix does have that and does it right. And I know that Detective McDermott will talk about that, but um, we're very appreciative that today you'll be able to uh, share what determines an investigation and how it, what is considered a hate crime, how Phoenix uh, deals with that. And so I'm going to turn over the mic and the presentation to Detective McDermott. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll have to, let's see, we're doing the share screen. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Detective McDermott with Phoenix PD. Um, I'm trying to get this I'll help you. Screen shared. I think it's working. Yeah, it is. It is? Okay. Yep. So I'll share with you uh, quite a lot of info on the bias crimes unit and how we do business. And it, um, 
one great thing about knowing how we do business is you can then use it for however you need it. And you know what the officers, um, if they come out for you for anything, you'll know what they should be doing. All right, so just make it full screen on the bottom and then we'll be ready. Did it work? Perfect, yes. Okay, so let me find this. So like I said, if you have a, um, a pressing question that you can definitely interrupt, um, but let's, let's save them to the end. Hopefully maybe you can write them down or because um, I'm sure you'll have questions. Um, there's a lot of information in here. So um, definitely what, what doesn't apply for you in your life, just feel free to tune it out because there's a lot. So you can pick what you need. Um, there's my name on there and um, work for the Phoenix Police Department with Bias Crimes Unit. My email is on there, but um, I'll, I'm, I can share any of my contact info with any of you. Let's see. Okay, so uh, like we, we do have the Bias Crimes Unit from 1987 is when it was established. Um, it's changed a lot in the years since then, but um, right now we're part of the Violent, Violent Crimes Bureau. Um, we have two detectives. It's changed over the years back and forth um, and the, we investigate all the bias crimes and bias incidents in the city of Phoenix. So I will talk about what it means to be a bias crime versus bias incident and bias we use with its hate crimes or hate incidents. The same um, terminology applies. We just, if we don't use the word hate, it doesn't really perpetuate hate as much. So we call it bias crimes, even though it is synonymous with hate crimes. Um, so in the whole country, it goes back and forth between five or six um, around their dedicated bias units. So that means that the investigators that are dedicated bias crimes or hate crimes detectives only do hate crimes. And then the Department of Justice considers the way that Phoenix does business, uh, the gold standard for hate crimes. I've consulted on their lesson plans. I've consulted other police chiefs in smaller departments across the country um, for starting up their um, bias units or what they should be doing. Um, different bias units across the country call me and ask me what if something is an actual hate crime or not or get advice from me. So that happens on a regular basis. Uh, so we, like I was just talking about, we partner with FBI hate crimes. Um, sometimes things that'll happen in the city could be considered um, an FBI hate crime, a civil rights violation. Usually they're not because those are very specific criteria, but um, the, I consult with them all the time so that um, if they're, if they could be used as a resource for me, I use them. Um, we do community outreach and training for everyone, anybody who wants it. So um, any of the groups that are considered protected or anybody who wants the training pretty much. Um, I, our bias unit is dedicated to improving the bias crimes investigations across the country. So um, we information, uh, knowledge that we acquire, we share it. We don't keep it for ourselves. We share it for anybody who wants it. Um, and we talked about the Department of Justice, their lesson plans. I've assisted in creating those and um, consulted on them and what should be in their website. They have a great website for the Department of Justice for um, hate crimes and different resources that are on there. And um, it's, it's really, really helpful, actually. It's really useful. Uh, we also do um, new officer recruit training. Every academy class gets bias um, training. We do um, like updates to training for investigative details that exist that, you know, officers that are already officers um, and other investigative details so that they can recognize the bias elements, the hate crime elements when they get reports or when officers arrive on scene and, and it's um, it's kind of hard to recognize some people who haven't especially been introduced to different hate crimes and, and bias crimes elements. 
um, a lot of people don't recognize right away what exactly is a hate crime. So we work with them so they can they can recognize them and forward that report or so to the appropriate person. Uh, we work with different um, foundations. And like, for instance, Matthew Shepard Foundation, we work with them and they um, last uh, late 2018, I believe, no, late 2019. We, we brought them and we did a national, um, I mean, um, a statewide training for, um, for any officer that would attend for federal and state bias crimes elements. Um, yeah, we've worked with AZ Post. That's the, the um, organization that certifies our officers. Um, and that's what they lay out the requirements for officers. So we've worked with them to make sure that um, the officers are certified in those things. So we're specialized investigations. Um, we're very aggressive with our investigative techniques. Most um, hate crimes are misdemeanors. So, you know, there's the difference between felonies and misdemeanors. Most hate crimes that come in are misdemeanors. And misdemeanors are happen very, very often in the city of Phoenix. So um, they get, they get an appropriate amount of attention normally, um, but they don't get the same amount of attention that a felony gets because felonies are usually much more violent or much more, um, It just, it just depends on what it is, if it's different types of felonies. But so our unit works the most, all the misdemeanors through to their every level, no stone unturned, much like we work it like a felony. So that's why we say we're very aggressive with the investigative techniques. We, we go through every kind of social media is great these days. Um, and with technology is just wonderful. We can, we can find out so many things. Um, we work with specific prosecutors, the city and the state. We have prosecutors that are trained in bias and hate crimes, and um, we work with them directly, making sure we get everything that we need. Um, we have specialized reports so that we can accurately um, articulate the bias that occurred, and we'll re report it to the FBI and to the state so that it is recognized as a hate crime, and that's extremely important. Uh, and then the last point in here talks about our um, the decision making process that patrol will sometimes recognize a hate crime and then forward it to the bias unit. Um, and then if that doesn't happen, the detectives, if they get sent a report, they can recognize the bias elements or the hate elements in a report, and then they can forward it to me after that. So we have um, different ways that hopefully the, the that incident doesn't slip through any cracks. So we contact every single victim. That's not the case with um, investigative units. And that's the standard that not every victim gets contacted um, with, with when I quote unquote normal crimes or something, but with all of our bias crimes, hate crimes, every victim gets contacted, every single one. So we let them know if it's this is, there's no way this is gonna go anywhere or um, we contact them to get more information to find out what's going on. Um, and then we contact offenders when that's as many offenders as, as we can. If there's information on the person who's the offender or suspect, um, I try to educate that person. Even if there's no way for um, prosecution or something, sometimes the, that education can really help the person to realize what they're doing is wrong and they need to stop what they're doing. So a lot of times this prevents further issues from happening. Um, you never know what people are gonna, how they're gonna react when I contact them. Sometimes they're very um, open to it. Sometimes they're not, so. Um, and then, like I said, there's no stone unturned even on misdemeanors. And that's, that's completely normal for most crimes that misdemeanors, um, they get the attention, but if we, there's just too many of them. So we can't investigate them like a homicide. We just can't. So there's a lot of words on the screen, but um, mainly just state law, um, the protected classes, 
um, our race, color, religion, sexual orientation, gender, and disability. Um, FBI adds a couple more than that. Um, so hate crime is considered offense against a person or a, a, um, against property motivated in whole or in part by the offender's race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. So the important part of that at the bottom where it says in whole or in part. So um, it to be a hate crime or hate incident. It doesn't have to be completely motivated by the um, offender's feelings toward a party. So when it says in part, that means that we had a situation happen, but it got es it escalated greatly because of the offender's feelings on um, one of those um, race, religion, disability, all those those groups. So the in part is important because we can we can use that for further prosecution and make make something. Um, um, we, it can actually spur into a whole other type of investigation or hate crimes investigation. So we talked about real quick, the differences, there's a bias incident or bias crime, um, hate crime, hate incident, they are very different, um, but they're both very important for, um, for investigations and for the community. So an incident fitting the description of a hate crime, but lacking a criminal element is a bias incident. So a bias incident may not be able to be prosecuted, um, may or may not. So um, it's important to, to document these incidents with police too, because um, we're tracking in trends, history and issues at the community. Um, I get a lot of bias incidents that are connected to people that are, uh, they're really showing a pattern of behavior and they're trying to um, either get around the law and still send messages to whatever group they're trying to send to. Um, so these, I've made, um, I've gotten several of these incidents which I was able to um, do investigation and turn them into um, a criminal investigation. It's happened many, many times. So even if you think it's not exactly a crime that occurred and um, it's still important to report it. And, um, some, and if the officer that comes out, like if they're saying no crime occurred, this, which is something that happens often, it's important to, for you to say, well, we're gonna report this and then just to not let him say that or her say that it's not a crime occurred. So I'm not gonna do anything about it. So it is, it, we absolutely, track and investigate bias incidents because a lot of them can turn into bias crimes very quickly. Quick question from the chat. Is age considered one of these biases? It is not, but well, it, um, we can investigate it in, in certain ways. It's not a protected class, but um, that just means that with um, legally, with Arizona revised statutes, it's not protected, but we can still investigate it the same way. So it doesn't exclude it. It just won't be, um, it's just not a protected class. Thank you. But I might be able to investigating stuff. Um, sometimes I can determine other hate elements that, that I have found. Mm, okay, so I think we got through all of that stuff on that slide. Still a lot of words, so I apologize. Um, so we'll just talk about mm, the Hate Crime St Statistics Act of 1990, which kind of led a good groundwork for all of this. Um, and then there's other laws that have just built on that that have made them even more strong. Um, so it's that the main thing is that it's voluntary for states to participate, but Arizona law, they wrote a law that says it is required. So it is absolutely required to report 
hate crimes, bias crimes data to the Department of Public Safety. So in turn, that means that it is in required for um, officers to document it. So it's so we get them to recognize those elements, and then it is absolutely a state law for them to write the report on this that this happened because we can't get them unless they're from reports. So they have to write the report. And then we analyze, collect, and report the bias crimes statistics to DPS, who then organizes it and reports it to the FBI. Oh, I don't know if we need anything on this. Um, but our unit, we come through reports to, so that we can find um, reports with bias elements because it is it is so difficult. It's such a gray area. Um, one person who doesn't think that there's, who's not very educated in bias and hate crime stuff that might not recognize bias elements because it's such a gray area. And so um, our unit, we will go through and do searches on um, the records management system so that we can find if there's reports that have fallen through the cracks. And then uh, another point I wanted to bring up this is the next bullet points. It, this is a, such a double-edged sword uh, because when we confront this, this problem, it, it, it really highlights how many um, bias crimes or incidents that come up. And so we put a spotlight on it. So um, when we compare it to other agencies who don't do this, it looks like that we have a huge problem when we have the similar problem as many other jurisdictions and cities anywhere, pretty much. Like, for instance, in 2017, um, Chicago reported 41 hate crimes, and we reported 230 in that same year. So do we? does that seem like that's accurate, that we would have 230 and Chicago would have 41 hate crimes? No, it's, that doesn't seem accurate at all. So with ours, we, we have the dedicated unit, so we highlight and address these issues. So it appears like we have more of a problem of hate crimes, but it's, it's very similar to any other large city across the country. Uh, let's see. So still a lot of words on this, but um, I want to redo this so that it's a little more streamlined. Um, but um, there's several different requirements that must be met so that we can report them to the FBI. Um, like the ones that are hate crimes, bias crimes must have the criminal element. Um, we don't really report the incidents to the FBI, the specific ones. Um, must be able to establish a bias. Sometimes I can't um, establish a specific bias because it's such a gray area. It's sometimes a little bit difficult. Um, the, the bias has to be a protected category. We just talked about that, like um, that age is not, like sometimes I'll get sent reports that, that it says a political party and that's not a protected class. Um, but with those, like I had one last week that it started out as a political party and I had a sense that it might be a specific bias and I contacted the victim and it actually was a specific bias and then it just didn't get documented completely. So that's the good thing about having the dedicated bias unit because sometimes you can find those reports. Um, this one's a really important part of it is the bias can be real or perceived. So the perceived bias of somebody, even if it's not true at all, it can still be a hate crime. So like if somebody was, um, pers I get a lot of these where somebody is either perceived to be gay or part of the LGBTQ community and they're not, um, it's still a hate crime. Absolutely, it doesn't change anything because it was perceived as bias. And then um, the last part of it is, um, there is a gray area and there is a little bit of a fine line between freedom of speech and the bias crime. So we make sure that um, we protect freedom of speech. Um, it's disorderly conduct is uh, one of the laws that I use a lot when I'm, and it's um, if someone is 
violating disorderly conduct, they are using bias phrases against a specific person. And that doesn't usually doesn't fall into covering covered under freedom of speech. So it, um, that's more disorderly conduct. You're trying to provoke somebody, you're trying to offend somebody, um, a specific person that you're talking to, like the, the offender is talking to a specific person, directing their comments toward a specific person that doesn't fall under freedom of speech. And a lot of people think that when I talk to them, they say, oh, it's my freedom of speech. I can say whatever I want. It's like, no, you can't say those offensive things to that specific person directly to that person. Oh, this just says, this talks about some of the racial slurs. Um, the, the fact that the officers can see um, that some, a victim might experience um, that leads to the hate crime or the bias incident, bias crime. Um, racial slurs, um, gestures and symbols, um, very important. Victim is a, a member of a group that is outnumbered in an area or a neighborhood. Um, we take into account the history of the neighborhood or the offender. And then the victim and witness perception. So it's, it's important the perception of everybody involved is important in a hate crime. So if someone perceives it to be a hate crime, that's important. So when we talk about that, some of the officers who come on scene, they may not, they might not talk about that stuff because that's um, much more complicated, more complex. So, but I will, when, when I get into my investigation part of it, we'll talk about the perception of um, the victims and the witnesses and the suspect if I can, um, talk to that suspect. Uh, another fact that's important is, is it a significant date or a holiday? Um, some, sometimes people want to send a message. Some suspects, uh, offenders want to send a message on a specific date um, or a holiday. So those are very important. And then recent activity. You know, we've had a lot of recent activity lately. So um, that's recent activity is very important. It goes into my investigation. It usually doesn't go into patrol officer investigation because that's a more complex part of it, but um, definitely goes into my investigation. So I just put these on there. They might be very difficult to see, but they are from the website. The, and I'll show you how to go on there if you want to um, on the Phoenix police website. Um, there was, let's see if I can move this because I can't see part of it. Okay, there we go. So if you have questions on any of these, um, feel free to ask, but it is, there are this, I just took a snippet, a little screenshot exactly from our website. So this is this year from, I mean, I'm sorry, 2020. January till October, and the number of um, hate crimes, hate incidents. Uh, do I have incidents on this one? I think it's um, just hate crimes. So the beginning of the year until almost April was pretty standard. There was not any significant changes. Um, and then April and May started to go up a little bit, and then June, through August got extremely busy. We had a huge jump in reported hate crimes. So <clears throat> I don't have any really explanations for that yet, but we can speculate all kinds of um, That's first and second quarter of 2019. We don't really, um, We've had so many changes since then, and I don't have um, them broken down by quarter for 2020. So if you wanted to see that, we can, but it's it's pretty outdated information. So there's national statistics. Um, these are important in recognizing the trends. Um, you know, uh, as of lately, we've, we've had, there's a lot of changes to take into effect. So, um, so we have on 2018, oh, I didn't change that red line on there. So sorry, just ignore that. 
the 2018, um, it was for the nation that was reported to the FBI 7,120 um, hate crimes were reported to the FBI. So 2019, there, were, there was an increase 7,314. Um, of those, 7,103 were single bias. That just means just one bias was indicated. Sometimes, you know, there can be two, um, but that was single bias. Um, so that just talks about there was some of those could be more than one victim and more than one offender um, for any of those instances. Most of them were um, single bias and single offender, but um, the majority were of those were motivated by race race, ethnicity, and ancestry bias, which are 57.6%. Um, and then there's some percentages. This is just straight from the FBI website. It's, it's all on there. Um, additional was religion was 19.9%, sexual orientation, 16.8%, gender identity, 2.7%, um, disability, 2%, and gender, 1%. So uh, they're, they're a lot of these are very grossly underreported. Um, as you can probably assume, um, there's there's more than one percent of hate crimes against someone's gender. Um, I, I'm sure you can assume that that's. I sometimes will get ones um, some against women, and they, they just don't report those at all. I'll get once in a while, and they just are not reported. So, but they're they're vastly underreported. Um, so just le legal history of hate crimes, 1968 um, Civil Rights Act um, was permitting the federal prosecution. Um, someone interferes with another person for race, color, religion, national orientation, national origin. Um, it was just kind of a, a, a blanket foundation law, which um, the Hate Crime Statistics Act of 1990 really expanded it um, to include sexual orientation. Um, and then 2009 um, expanded it greatly. Um, the Matthew Shepard and James Beard Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Oh, how do I move this thing? Oh, come on. I'm sorry, I'm so bad with technology. <laughs> Well, I can't move it, but it includes it. it you want to go back um, that little at the bottom corner. There's like a little arrow. You see a little like at the end of the underneath the FBI logo, all the way at the bottom of that screen. Okay, okay. I don't know if you see it, but if not, you try it with your uh, right and left uh, arrows on your keyboard. Okay, got it. Um, so that, that was a very important legislation that we can use greatly. Um, so it included sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. So um, all those very important. Um, so the FBI, uh, they're the regulating body, de de uh, I'm sorry, Department of Justice. Um, defines what hate crime is and how they're applied across the United States. Um, so there's different organizations for federal hate crimes. We don't use a lot of federal hate crimes because they're they're pretty specific. There has to be like um, substantial threats involved. In, and when with state law, they don't have to be as substantial as a threat, not as direct. So um, so then that's we're just talking about some of the the regulations that we can use um, and we we use our resources if I've turned over several cases that I've gotten that I, I just it would be much um, it's too federal called the FBI or any of those um, other agencies that they can take my report from me and then they can do the investigation I hate giving them up because I you know if, if it's my report I want to see it through but um, with some things I just call them and say this would be a great federal investigation and turn it over to them. Um, and that just talks about the you know, civil rights, civil liberties violations um, versus a biased crime. 
So um, with local law enforcement, assault, criminal damage, threats, harassment, those are the most, I guess, popular, if you will, of the bias crimes um, that I get. And um, so all of those I can see through the investigation. Um, so the FBI primarily discriminates with, um, I mean, I'm sorry, investigates with discrimination, um, different types of things. Um, but there are still federal um, laws that we can use um, that on a lot, of, for instance, with a lot of neighbor, um, neighbor disputes, which I get a lot of, uh, some of those could fall into like the Fair Housing Act. And so we just have to, um, there's so many variables, so we just have to see through which way it would go and which way would be best. Oh, this, uh, I have to update this um, for the number of states, but we have most states in the nation have hate crimes laws specifically. Um, there are several states, it's less than 15 now, um, but not much less than 15 that, <clears throat> that address um, hate crimes, but they don't um, include sexual orientation or gender identity. So, but all the rest um, include all the other protected classes. Um, and then Arizona, um, it's a, it's, considered a, um, a criminal offense committed against a person or property, which is motivated by the offender's bias. And then it's like we have it in Arizona where it's real or perceived, which is really important um, against a race, color, religion, sexual orientation, gender, or disability. So that's what it says for Arizona, um, which is, is very, very close to the national standard. So like we talked about just a second ago, most of our um, crimes that we receive that my reports that I get, harassment, threatening, intimidating, criminal damage, theft, disorderly conduct, assault, and aggravated assault. Um, our unit will help out with, with some things that were um, homicides. Sometimes we get, but we don't investigate homicides or sexual assaults. Um, but all those others on the list are, um, we get on a re regular basis, all of those. Hopefully we're getting through this. Um, so this is a really important part. Um, this is the thing that I want the, um, the public to know if anybody wanted to take action on anything like this. Um, it is state law, is not a standalone criminal violation, um, but it's a enhanced sentencing. That means that if it's felony only, not misdemeanor, if it's a felony crime that's committed, if the hate crime or bias incidents are, are shown to be factors, then someone can get uh, up to 10 years guaranteed time in a, on a top of a, um, a sentence. So, but it's felony only, it doesn't apply to misdemeanors. And then most of our cases that we get by far, by vastly far, um, over 90%, I don't have, the, the number changes it very often, but far over 90% of our cases are misdemeanors. So that's one reason why we investigate the misdemeanors so thoroughly, because sometimes they can turn into felonies and they get more violent, um, but, the, our hate crimes application is for sentencing and for misdemeanors. I mean, I'm sorry, for felony charges only. So we have no misdemeanor hate application in the state. So the cities that have a city ordinate, ordinance against um, bias incidents and bias crimes, Tucson, Scottsdale, Phoenix, and Flagstaff. This just talks about our city ordinance. <clears throat> so lots of words, if you wanna read it, you can, but um, just talks about being free from discrimination in public accommodation is in employment. Um, and it says all those protective classes. So city of Phoenix is, is 
um, above the national standard for that because of all the protected classes that they include. So what does it all mean? How does it affect you? Um, like we we're talking about the hate crimes bias, crimes bias incidents are very underreported. Um, they do not just impact, impact the victim, they impact the entire community. Um, we thoroughly understand that in the bias unit. Um, bias crimes escalate without intervention. One reason why we investigate the misdemeanors um, so thoroughly because they escalate. Um, we understand, myself and the other detective, understand that hate crimes and bias crimes, bias incidents are message crimes. The, the suspect, perpetrator, whatever want, you want to call the person is trying to send a message, not just to that person, but the entire community. So it's important that we investigate all of these as, as much as we possibly can. Um, so we when we're talking about how bias crimes and incidents, they escalate without intervention. Major incidents, there was almost always, so you can't say always, but the many, many, many times there were prior incidents that occurred from a suspect before um, a giant hate crime happened. So um, if we can try to get involved in it earlier, there's a possibility exist, um, we can keep them on a lower level. But um, those major incidents, there's been, there was small incidents that occurred before that led up to them. So it's your responsibility to report this. Um, like I said, even if it's not a big deal, um, I understand I hear it all the time that is so much easier just not to report it and forget about it, um, but then we can't track it. We can't find the, those responsible people um, that they're either repeat offenders. I have I found lots of repeat offenders from different incidences. So um, if a few people are reporting, I'm at, I can't even imagine how many people this, this person is impacting if it's an offender or a suspect. Um, so it's very important to report them, even if it's not a, a big deal. Um, and, it, and it might not be a big deal to other people or even the responding officer um, if they're not very educated in hate crimes, but it is a big deal. It affects everyone in the community. And if if one community is affected that greatly, then all the rest of the communities should care about it, even if they don't, they should care. So if our reporting draws attention to that and hopefully it can um, make an impact of some kind. Um, there's just a different reporting um, FBI, Attorney General's Office, um, Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Attorney General's Office. Those are all different um, reporting ways uh, for civil liberties. So, so you might know um, there is a non-emergent number for Phoenix Police. There is uh, 911 is your emergency if something is happening right away or if something is um, extremely important, emergent. Um, we also have online reporting if um, there if it falls under the categories and let you report online, like suspect unknown and stuff like that. You can report online, any of those things. So you're saying hate crimes can be reported online? Yes, um, and if there is no suspect information, but if there has to be any investigative measures at all, like pictures taken, the, they will use, the website will usually direct you to call. Um, mm -hmm. Because like if something is criminal damage, if there's something graffiti put somewhere, then um, we need to take pictures of that so then the, it'll direct you to uh, to make a, a a report like um, either on the phone with an officer or have an officer come out. So this is just information. So if, if you're reporting um, and then an officer was to come out, or if um, you're doing something on over the phone with an officer, 
uh, if the police are called, um, the investigating um, initial officer should conduct interviews with everybody, um, should gather the evidence, whether it's physical surveillance, um, social media, take photographs. Um, and then the case assigned to the detective will review the case. Um, I call the victim, I verify if the person wants prosecution or if that's still, um, sometimes that changes, sometimes people um, just want to move on and don't want to prosecute. So um, that's what I verify the prosecution. Um, then I go through and conduct a follow up to get additional evidence. Where's it? And then hopefully I can, depending on how the investigation goes, I can submit the case or I can go arrest the suspect, depending on what happens. There's so many variables, so it's 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 hard to say what will happen, but um, if I have enough evidence and know who the suspect is, I'll either submit the case or I'll arrest the person. So these are important for um, if you're reporting something that happened, we can work with the details that, that you give us. So um, who was it, a description, or if you know exactly who the person is, as much information as you can give. Um, what you saw before, during, and after um, the, the incident or the crime. So before and during is super important. Um, when it occurred, where it occurred, um, and then for people who are reporting hate crimes or um, hate incidents, why you think this happened. So that might not be important for like um, quotes, regular crimes, but why that you think it happened is important for bias incidents and bias crimes. Um, and exact words are very important, especially for differentiating between different bias. Um, I'll get a lot where somebody will just the officer will write that they used racial slurs or bias statements. I need to know exactly what they are. So um, just don't don't be afraid to tell the officer exactly what was said. Um, I know sometimes it can be um, either painful or um, very stressful. Um, we need to know exact words that were said. And then it's important to remember the statute of limitations. Um, if something's not reported right away, um, for misdemeanors, it's one year, felonies is seven years. So if, if something is reported even a little bit after, um, it should be reported right away, but the statute of limitations is important. Some people will call and say, wanna report something that happened months ago. Um, those are pretty difficult to investigate, but, but statute of limitations is important. So there's some other resources um, for websites. Um, to get more information, um, a lot of these, I, I mean, I can email any of these to anybody or um, um, so that we can get them later on. <clears throat> we get a lot of graffiti um, up here in the bias unit and the ADL has a great library on graffiti and symbols, which I use pretty often. I can't remember everything for every group that is important. So um, I'll do a lot of research, I'll look on websites. Um, Department of Justice, uh, they, they have a lot of good information on there. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center, they do a lot of really good work. And then the FBI has a lot of good information on civil rights on theirs. So this is, uh, it's not exactly what the website looks like as far as picture wise, but um, it's how you get to what's, where the stats are. If you go on phoenix.gov, um, there is a, um, a police uh, tab that you can click on and you, it will take you down on the, um, like I said, these pictures are not the same on there, but uh, this crime maps and statistics that big arrow, um, you can click on that and you can click on 
the which quarter or the calendar years that you want to see for the um, um, bias crime statistics. We update them every quarter. So uh, December just ended. So near the end of January, hopefully that the last quarter of 2020 will be on there. So just to reiterate the, the biggest issue um, I feel with hate crimes is a lack of reporting and then the law enforcement agencies not um, investigate them properly. So there's a lot of things that go into the lack of reporting for the victim. I mean, these are difficult situations that, that someone may have been in and it has to be stressful and sometimes painful to to go through the event again with a stranger and talk about what happened and then waiting for the person to investigate it all those things are it's difficult so um i understand that hopefully that they'll the the responding officer will be sympathetic of that it, um and even if not i am sympathetic of that so um it's it's important uh, i uh, to completely reiterate to to report them. I know it is difficult, but um, the hate crimes are message crimes and it is reporting it hopefully will lead to um, a good outcome um, if we have enough for it. So we talked about that, you know, Phoenix investigates these thoroughly. And so it, it, it looks like that we have a higher numbers than other other places or um, especially if they report zero hate crimes for other cities, other big cities. Um, but it's, if we cannot fight what we don't measure, and if we don't um, direct our efforts to it, then we're not gonna know what the problem is or where it is, and we're not gonna know how to address it. So it's very important that we have accurate numbers for bias crimes and bias incidents. and and. I know that our department will continue to do that. Um, so, and like at the bottom it says, we can't help you if you don't report. So it's extremely important to report these, even if it's not a crime. If if somebody says, well, it's not a crime, we, it's still important to report these incidents. And I think that was it. So we can, um, answer any questions. I'm sorry that ran a little bit long, but um, I'm available for any questions that anybody has. So um, I guess I'm going to ask a question from the chat for you. First of all, thank you so much. I'm going to just um, stop your sharing so you can see okay. it on the full screen. So I guess one of the questions that came up in the chat is, and I think it's something that you sort of addressed, it's like, okay, sometimes officers who come to take a report don't necessarily see the crime and therefore it's like, there's nothing to report, but there's a bias uh, involved in whatever is being reported. So what's the best way to handle an officer like that? Uh, and I think that maybe when you answer your question, if you can share, I guess, not just the Phoenix department way to do that, but we have people also here that would be part of Scottsdale PD and other uh, departments. And you just, they want to make sure it's, let's say, reported as a hate crime or at least investigated um, if it is a hate crime. What's the best way to, is that to ask for a supervisor or is there a different? Yeah, you can always ask for a supervisor. If um, it is the officer's job to recognize that it is a hate crime or not, it, and the, it's hard to train somebody to do that. It is difficult. Um, but, and so they might not always see it, especially if they've been on a long time or if they're not um, sympathetic to those types of things. Some people are just more logical. I need the facts. That's, I mean, sometimes that's who a person is there. It's hard to see that gray area, even though some people it's, it's very easy. Um, but if they're not seeing it, then absolutely ask for a supervisor. It is law to record these and to report them, even if it's an incident. So um, the, ask for a supervisor or um, I might, if I was involved in something, I might point out again to this officer that this, this is what happened. These are the elements of it. And, um, but if they're not seeing it, absolutely ask for a supervisor. 
And even if they don't do a standard um, quote report, we have, I guess there's smaller reports that, that, that somebody can write like for information or such um, and still get it to me. And if, if they're not wanting to write it as a report, just write, wanting to write it as a, um, one of those smaller reports, it doesn't matter to me. I'll, if I need to make it a report, I will. But um, I, Scottsdale does not have a, de oh wait, they don't have a dedicated bias unit. Um, so I don't know what their reporting is, um, but um, citizens can get that changed if you press the issue with either if you wanted to contact the, um, the police department or whoever. Um, but they, it's still like, I, like we were just talking about, it's still state law to um, investigate bias crimes and such. So you could still get it report, um, your report, if you're in Scottsdale, forwarded to an investigator, it's, it would still be their job to investigate it. So, and then you'd find, you'd get a hold of that person's supervisor if, if it's not being investigated. Thank you. Um, and then from the chat, can you give an example of gender bias? Gender bias would be um, it, the, one of the easiest ones for me to portray is like someone calling um, a woman a name in the street, um, a name that is associated with only um, a bias against a woman. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, or it's the same thing, vice versa, or someone gender bias calling somebody a man a name that's only um, a derogatory against a man. Okay, thank you. Um, if that person has a follow-up, they'll either unmute or, or um, Bob, you had a question? Uh, yeah, uh, about the concerning freedom of speech and, and uh, versus uh, crime in general. So um, I, as I understand it, you can say pretty much anything you want in general. You could say you could curse out Jews for, for whatever, claim that the Holocaust never occurred. Uh, but if you direct that to, to a specific person and say, you know, you, you're a, a, a dirty Jew, whatever, you know, something in that, uh, in that vein, that, that then it becomes a crime and, and a hate crime. Is yes. that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is that a hate incident until they've directed it with a threat? No, um, because if that if the person's statements towards you provoked you in any way um it's there's a lot of gray area around this um but if it if they were doing it intending you to offend provoke um those are the direct words from the arizona law so if they're intending to offend you um then it, we have that disorderly conduct, words, gestures, language to provoke. That's a specific law. So, um, but we have to thoroughly articulate how did it provoke you? Like you have to have a significant response. And I'm and with one the example that you were just talking about, that would be a. You, I'm sure that you would have a significant response to that. So. Um, Thank you. Are these, sense. yeah, are these, I'm curious because like you're using a good word, gray area. Uh, are these difficult to prosecute? Like, do you find that certain uh, judges are not as uh, uh, of listening to these types of cases? I don't find that. Um, since I am really good at this, at um, our th the threats or disorderly conduct or something when, when there's hate speech being directed at one specific person when it, it when it really falls into the criminal element. Um, I'm really good at articulating how it affected, how it provoked or offended this person and, um, and what the intent was, the perception was of everyone involved. So once we have all those elements, I haven't had any judges turn any of these down, but we have to have all those things. It has to be very thorough. And like I said, when we're talking about a significant response to the provoking, do you know what I mean by that? 
So if some, um, I will get some that will say somebody used a specific word, but the victim either just left or got out of there, didn't didn't have any response, and then um, just called. Does the response mean an emotional trauma? It could be. There's a lot. There's so many things. So many gray areas. So. Um, you know, you could you say like uh, I, I was felt threatened, so I um, I increased the security at my home or something like that. That might be a. Uh, yeah, like if it's a neighbor who's doing that, and then you know the person might it, there's a there's a high chance, or if somebody knows where you live or something like that. Like there has to be, um, and a reasonable person would suspect that this can continue to happen. Um, well, I mean, and that one might be harassment. So, I mean, it's just, um, but yes, that could fall into that. Like if somebody is, who is doing this, um, this behavior, like we're talking about, if increasing this, the security of your home or um, like changing the ways that you behave in your home or the times that you go out or you know, changing your behavior because of something else that happened. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a stupid question. Uh, on a civil side of this, can I, can someone then sue that person for the trauma? Meaning does the civil side work the same way the criminal side works? No, that's totally different. And I don't know almost anything about it, but you can sue somebody for anything. Yeah, I know. no, I know my question, I, I use, uh, I think everyone uses OJ Simpson as the best example of the difference between criminal and civil, you know, you can be acquitted in the criminal court, but the civil court has a, a, le a lower threshold of guilt, I guess is the right word. Um, yes. so, so in other words, he could, he could lose the civil court case and owe $32 million, but actually be acquitted of, of murder. So that's why I was wondering if this, if in other words, do we apply it the same way, but I guess that's not your field. So that's a good point. Yeah. Um, sorry. I don't know. No, no worries. Sheldon, you had a question. Yes, uh, I, we've noticed in the past in McCormick Ranch where we live that during election time, uh, if you have lo so signs on your lawn for candidates whose names seem to be Jewish, they have been knocked over. Would that be considered a hate crime as well as a trespass? We, um, we, it's only done at night late at night, I guess, of course, when people aren't awake, uh, our doorbell wouldn't ring doorbell doesn't go far enough to take a picture of who the person was. But at this point, it seems uh, it is almost dangerous, or it seems dangerous to put out anything to identify your Jewish. I mean, if we, we've had a menorah hanging in the window and, you know, certain times we feel uncomfortable doing that because if someone drives by and sees that they may do something that uh is a trespass or a violation of uh our religious rights i don't know if anyone else feels that way but uh that's the way we feel that with a we rather not put it up because we feel that there'll be retribution for it is there any way to resolve that other than reporting it to the police department. And I have heard exactly what you're saying from several people. So it's, it's I definitely echo what um, some of the victims that I've talked to have said the same thing that you have said. So um, for it to be a biased crime, we have to have something that is significant to, uh, I don't even wanna to say too significant because if it's your perception, that is important. And right. I can use that. Not safe to, it's, it's, you're looking for trouble by doing that, by mm -hmm. expressing. And, uh, and I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but I would imagine that it would not happen to someone, uh, any of our neighbors that have that Christmas decorations, because they all seem fine. So it's right. in particular, I think, to someone that's Jewish, uh, that they would have to be concerned about that. Sheldon, move to my block. I'll protect you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm gonna let the detective answer that. 
All right, thank you. Well, I, I'm, and just to sort of hone his question down, I guess the first part is two parts. Um, if, if there is a sign that has a Jewish candidate and someone, I guess, damages it, is that considered a hate crime or is that political? How do, how do you determine if that's, and, and like you said, political would not be a protected class. Jewish would be a protected class. So how do you determine that? Well, the political is definitely not protected, but um, so what I would get, since I've gotten a lot of reports um, over the season, over last season, which somebody would put something on there, damage it in a way that would be specific to anti-Jewish. So I did get a lot of those. Um, so, but if it's just damage that doesn't suggest any bias, it usually wouldn't go to me um, unless you as the victim have, you convey your perception that this is anti-Jewish. Um, so, but, but for, for to count it as a hate crime or hate incident, we need something that is, that we can say, this is why we feel this way. Um, we have to answer the question. So, um, but I, like I said, I did get a lot where somebody, the damage, they put specific anti-Jewish damage on signs and such like that. Um, so it definitely could be considered um, a hate crime if it's damaged or um, if it's stolen during a specific time or something like that, and it's your perception. So Sheldon, I guess we have to talk to Scottsdale. Uh, he lives in Scottsdale. So that has to be a Scottsdale police uh, conversation. And they can consult with me. <laughs> they, they, that, that doesn't usually happen, but I, I, Scottsdale never has called me, but the several other agencies have consulted with me on specific issues, yeah. I, I can't say it's everywhere, but... Uh, oh, it's everywhere, absolutely, yeah. At least where we live, it's it's almost like you feel uncomfortable in putting anything out that identifies you uh, as Jewish. And that, that what we were just talking about, like how that's that message crime that people commit a crime because they want to send a message to the whole community and then we're perceiving that message. So it's the, the power is in the knowledge. If we're hopefully reporting it, if we have any evidence that we can try to get a hold of this person who is doing it, uh, then we do so. Like I've had a few cases that wouldn't have been as thoroughly investigated because they're misdemeanors, because um, um, like to write a search warrant and stuff like that, it's a lot of a lot of work. So I've been able to identify some suspects and things that typically wouldn't have gotten investigated as far. Okay, thank you. Uh, Betty and Stan, I'm not sure who has the question, but. I have, I have one. Let's say uh, if I have a fear that somebody might do something, to, but nothing happens, that's not really a crime. I mean, if I think that somebody in my neighborhood might do something because I'm putting up a Christmas tree or I'm putting up a Hanukkah menorah and nothing is happening and I don't want to put it in the window because I'm afraid something might happen, is that my responsibility or, or where does the responsibility lie? You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if, I, if it's just my own fear as opposed to an actual incident. If, you know, three houses down the block have had an incident where their Hanukkah window was smashed because they saw a Hanukkah window. I understand that. But if it's just that it's my fear because I'm in a predominantly Christian neighborhood that I'm, being Jewish is going to stand out and somebody might do something, where does that fall? It's not really a crime. Right. But if, if you have more beyond that, like of a, if a history of things have been happening, um, then that makes sense. But um, but yeah, we have to manage our own fears. I'll get a lot of things where a lot of reports where someone will, something significant happened and I investigated it. Even I had one where I arrested the person and then the victim was like, well, what do I do now when they get out? I'm like, well, they're going to get out. So you ha we have to, you have to be, I know some people think that you can just lock, lock them up and throw away the key. And that is not the case. The person, the suspect will get out of jail. So you have to manage your own fears and do what you need to do for your own life and to make sure that you and you keep your family safe because there's not 
there's a lot of times where there's not going to be people to like save us. So, um, it, but we do what we can when we can. I have to tell you that we were ushering at the Jewish Film Festival and we uh, attended a, uh, a conference with the Phoenix police where, where an officer came in and instructed us how to look at people, how to analyze potential threats, what to do, what not to do. And it was, and it was very, you know, this is uh, two years ago. And uh, it was terrific, very informative. Little baby. We, we might need to bring that person on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was very good. He, he, I don't know his name, but I'm sure you can track it down. But uh, he, was, he was terrific, terrific. Well, you... I am also certified in that, um, where it's like workplace, like, um, it's like it, how to keep your family safe in public is what we call it, but it's like, it's, and it's how to serve, it's pretty much how to survive a mass shooting. So, so, um, and how you can look at people and how you can make sure that you know what your surroundings are and stuff like that. So I have to tell yeah. you that we live in New York City. We, we grew up in New York City, and I, I and I took a field trip with a, my uh, class to the UN. And the bus pulled up in front of the UN, and the other teacher and I got out to make sure everything was ready. And all of a sudden, she turns to me. She says, "You're not walking the same way." I said, "I'm in the city. You have to walk like you know where you're going. <laughs> you turn your jewelry around so nothing shows. Put your handbag under your arm." Keep your eyes straight and don't look at anybody. Thank, thank, thank you. We're going to remember that as soon as we start traveling again to the city. Uh, Charlie, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, you had said that uh, the women's uh, 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 reporting was extremely low. Is that because women are afraid if they file a complaint? that they're going to be persecuted in some way? Or is there, uh, as you just said, uh, they're afraid if, a, if someone goes to jail, they're going to come after them in the future? There uh, would, have that fear? What is it? The, the, I don't know specifically. There would be so many answers for that. And I know that one that, that just being in this field for a significant amount of time that that is across the board for hate crimes it is easier to not report it you don't have to go through the incident again you don't have to relive the emotions the feeling you don't have to worry about somebody asking you questions or even stupid questions um, about what happened to you and you 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 I've heard that there is more control for somebody not reporting it because they can control their emotions and then they can move on or whatnot. So, um, you know, you won't have to deal with an officer being judgmental or not the, the fear of that, if it, how it's going to be perceived, how somebody is going to be believed. Um, and all, because all these groups that are the protected classes are essentially kind of marginalized populations and tend to be a little less believed in socially, which is not okay whatsoever. Not okay. And so, um, it might be that just the fear that the person, the victim, is either going to be not believed or um, that they're not going to be taken seriously enough, maybe. But these are just um, a lot of speculations, and I'm echoing the things that I've heard. Thank you. So um, I guess I'm, I'm curious on that point, then. Do you find that certain of the protected classes are more willing to make a report than others? I have found that, um, yes. So um, the protected class of religion and for the Jewish religion are more, um, well, and even Jewish ethnicity, whatever, um, what are more prone to make reports, yes. Um, and um, African-American reports, I get a, a high amount of, um, it's the, the disability and the gender um, and gender identity. So like for even like transgender, I don't get very many reports of those whatsoever. And I'm sure that the transgender bias crimes are very high and I don't get very many. I get a lot of um, 
another one that's really high is um, that like the anti-gay male reports. I get a lot of those. So those are the highest ones. So um, question, because I noticed on your statistics, you had three different lines. One was anti-gay, one was, I think, LGBT, Q, maybe Q as well, and then they had transgender again. Is that, is there a reason? Um, well, I don't, uh, I'll have to look and see if they, they included LGBTQ as one of the, um, I'll mention that as, as a community or a group, but our statistics, it breaks them up into um, anti-gay male, anti-lesbian, anti-transgender, they're broken up because anti-transgender is completely different group than anti-gay, it's totally different. Okay, so they don't, in other words, you might put it as a stat line one place in a group, but really they're, in, they're independent. Yes, yeah, they're very independent, yeah. Okay, I thought I saw it as three different lines. When you put the newest statistics, like the up until October quarter, yeah, I know that transgender is one that's not broken up further than that, but transgender is one specific one. Okay. Any other um, questions? This is a lot of information. I appreciate it. And I, and I just want to echo some that you mentioned. Um, for those of you who don't know, this isn't in the news, but like we have a menorah that's always across from the state capitol and someone damaged the sign saying specific, they, they ripped it off. I don't even think they damaged it. Um, but basically they say, because it's a Jewish symbol, and I know that like the question going through my head as I was answering questions from the officer or the trooper was like, you know, do I want to see this person in court type of a thing? Um, that's really how I was thinking it. Obviously we reported it, but I'm saying that I, I think that's kind of the mindset. It's like, it's not necessarily about the questions of the officer, um, but also it's like, do I want to face this person who already showed hate? And for the menorah, there wasn't a victim that was a person. It was a symbol and an organization behind it but I automatically become the face of that by reporting it. So that, you know, I think that's what people kind of uh, struggle or grapple with when they're reporting. Um, Betty, you had, Stan, you had a question? Yeah, one question. Do you run into situations where somebody reports something because they have something against somebody and it's not true? Oh, oh, of course, <laughs> but, but we do the investigation or, I mean, when you say not true, it yeah, could be. You know, I, I don't like so and so, and he happens to be black or lesbian or gay or whatever, you know, that type of thing. And I make a comment that they said something anti Jewish. And, you know, they never even said it, but because I don't like him, I'm making the kind of, you know, that's my sickness. I'm not, you know, but I'm, you know, understand what I'm saying, but it's not true. What do they have to do? You're to basically, me? you're saying they make up a crime to get someone in trouble. Yeah, yeah. I make, yeah, I make up a false, you know, it's false, a false, it's a false accusation. Yeah, so the, the, it all comes out in the investigation, hopefully. But, and like, if what we were talking about before, about how I leave no stone unturned, I will do a lot of education, even if there's no crime that I can, it, I mean, it, it might even fall under crime, but there's no way that a prosecutor is going to push this through because it's it's either... Um, it's too convoluted or it's too complex or it's too um, there's too much history between like two people or something um, so I do a lot of education and so um, I talk less what we were talking about I talk to every every suspect that I can even if they're not exactly a suspect that I've talked to people and I've and um, there's like one specific one I can think of is that the victim didn't want um, prosecution and it wasn't there's no way that a, that a prosecutor was going to push this through um, and that the person was saying the n-word and I told them that they couldn't say that anymore and that that was illegal and that they the person the suspect so to speak they weren't really a suspect so but they had a significant response saying that I understand that I cannot say this to anybody and that if I continue to do this I will be on um included in S FBI statistics for hate crimes. And so um, there's, there's, I do so much education for people, even if I'm not going to be um, submitting this through the criminal side of things. So that's, that, that's one of the benefits of having the dedicated bias units is that I can do that. And a lot of other units, they may or may not do that, I don't know. Well, we have a, we have a situation here in New York where in uh, Central Park, um, 
this black man was bird watching and uh, he was in an area where you had to have your dog on a leash and this white lady let her dog off the leash and uh, he went up to her and said you have to leash your dog and she accused him she called the police call you know said that he was assaulting her and used uh, uh, obscene language he took out his cell phone he videotaped her this became a whole hullabaloo and she ended up losing the dog, losing her job. She's now in uh, trial. He does not want to be participate in the trial at all. This is uh, this is all the new 2020, I'm going to use the word that's always used. Unbelievable. Karen. Karen. You know, that's the word that they use for that. She was a Karen, right? Yes, that, exactly. That's the story that they... Actually, I have to tell you, we have a niece named Karen and she's suffering like crazy. <laughs> But I have gotten the, the premise that you talked about, I will get those. And so it's, that's the good thing about me getting them is we can investigate it. And sometimes we can place charges where they need to be or where, or the education where it needs to be. I like what you say. Sometimes just knocking on a door and saying, hey, it's the police and we want to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. That's already uh, enough of a deterrent and education. So... Um, if there aren't any last minute questions, I want to uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was a really informative presentation and a lot of information. Uh, but I guess the biggest takeaway is there, that in Phoenix, it's taken seriously. And if you truly think that there was a crime or a bias, definitely report it. So thank you. Now on that note, uh, if there are last minute questions, definitely um, now would be your chance. If not, thank you, Detective McDermott. We really appreciate this and all of your time.